Brain injury survivor Daniel talks about what therapy was most helpful in his recovery, what he would have done differently, the doctor-patient relationship, and his advice for other survivors, their families, and treaters. Hi, I'm Dan Gardner, and I talk about traumatic brain injury. And today I'm glad to be talking with traumatic brain injury survivor Daniel. Traumatic brain injury recovery. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, Dr. Gardner. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for talking with me today. So, Daniel, tell me, when was your brain injury and how did it happen? My injury happened um, November 7th, 2013. Mm -hmm. And it was a motor vehicle accident. I was um, struck by, a, I was riding my motorcycle and an SUV crashed into me um, because she didn't see me. Now, I'm going to ask you a little about your injuries and the problems that resulted from the accident. But before I do, I'd like to know a little about your life before the injury. Can you tell me about it? Sure. Um, before my injury, I was living in L.A. I had a normal uh, nine to five job as a customer support representative um, for a small software company. And I had a girlfriend. Um, I had a roommate. I um, did, I don't know how to describe it other than that, it was like pretty normal. You know, I like did things on the weekends. I had a pretty good life relatively, not much stress relative. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was stressed about my job at the time a lot, but other than that, it was normal stuff. Mm -hmm. Did you like your job? I did like my job. I actually loved my job. Um, it was It was a small company and I think partly because it was so small, there was a lot of team spirit, I guess. Everyone was sort of looking out for each other because we we had that uh, startup culture kind of situation going on mm -hmm. in terms of everyone looking out for everyone. And like we, we all very much sensed that everyone's effort was a measurable contribution. Like we could sense all, all of everyone's, everyone's effort was very sensible to the whole team. So it was an exciting time, and it was enjoyable to collaborate with a startup team. Yeah, it was it was great. It was uh, my favorite job, actually. Good. So you had this accident. Tell me what injuries you sustained and how this changed your life since the injuries. So it was there were a lot of injuries. Um, I broke both of my legs and my left arm and my left hip and a bunch of my ribs. I had a collapsed lung. I had, um, I was in a coma for about a month. Um, a month, I see. And I also broke um, several of the small bones in my inner ears, which was pretty detrimental because it severely affected my hearing. Mm -hmm. So fortunately I had procedures done to um, restructure my ear canals so that they so that my hearing would return to normal. And fortunately, I have normal hearing these days. So mm -hmm. um, that, that is fortunate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here you have pretty, any other procedures. Um, I, yeah. So because I broke both of my legs, um, I had my my legs became very stiff. Um, so I had I had procedures done. They were called um, manipulations under anesthesia. So they basically put you to sleep, and then they bend your legs all the way back so that mm -hmm. so that you have the full regular range of motion again. I see. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also had a procedure done to take the extra bone out of my arm because I had heterotopic ossification in my left arm. So mm -hmm. so I was not able to supinate my left hand like I'm showing. Um, and so that was, I mean, for a long time, I couldn't do that at all, which was bizarre, um, very, you know, debilitating <laughs> relatively. Like you, you need your, you need both of your hands usually. So, so I, getting that fixed was a, a blessing. So tell me, the, you, you mentioned a number of injuries. How do these injuries affect your life? Um, they were pretty debilitating at first. Um, I had to relearn how to walk, which I still remember, like learning how to do that. And that was very difficult and painful. 
because my muscles had been very much atrophied after you know a month of not using them and mm-hmm. and i assume also just having bones in the wrong places was difficult for my muscles to adjust to around the bones so so yeah um learning how to walk was tough learning how to use my arms properly because for a long time i didn't use my left arm um i just wasn't i might be a brain injury thing but i just sort of wasn't i have what's called left side neglect mm-hmm. so so for a long time i didn't move the fingers on my left arm at all so i went through i mm-hmm. definitely did therapy that was hand focused therapy you mentioned orthopedic problems you also mentioned that you were in a coma for a month so how was your brain affected in this accident so the first thing that comes to mind is my memory was particularly my short term memory was extremely damaged to the to the extent that i wouldn't remember what had happened just minutes earlier mm-hmm. um which fortunately has been getting progressively better and better um, good yeah so that's that was pretty crippling for a long time just not remembering what had happened or things that had happened and I, not only that but i a fair amount of my autobiographic memory was gone too so i didn't know like when i came out of the coma i didn't know how old i was or where i lived or anything about my family or my personal history eventually it all came back relatively more or less but how long did that take months and months and months um So I was in four hospitals, two in two in Los Angeles and two in San Diego, and then several rehabilitation programs after those. Um but I would say that really my memories were coming back throughout the entire time. So mm-hmm. how long were you in the hospitals before you came home? So I was in pretty much one hospital per month. like so the accident happened and then like a month of one hospital and then a month of the next hospital and then a month of the next hospital and so on mm-hmm. so four four months of hospitalization i guess and then after that i was still doing rehab but not but based i was you know going to and from my house to do rehab sure now you mentioned you had memory problems from the accident did you have any problems with concentrating or organizing any problems with emotional regulation i don't really i didn't really have i definitely had problems with concentration um and i definitely have and i still have problems with spatial relationships so one example of that and i still have this problem is getting lost in parking lots or getting lost anywhere mm-hmm. getting lost is a big problem um and it continues to be a big problem sort of i mean i've figured out compensatory strategies for some things um but i still i mean i i know everyone gets lost sometimes well maybe not everyone but a lot of people get lost even without a brain injury but mm-hmm. i i would get lost very frequently at first so i see how did the injury affect your ability to drive your ability to dress and feed so, yourself and shop and pay <laughs> pay bills and use a computer all of those so activities I, of daily living yeah so i basically couldn't do any of them um i couldn't drive for a long time relatively i'm not sure how many months but definitely at least a year mm-hmm. um and i had to go through a fair amount of vision therapy which mm-hmm. which was as far as therapy goes vision therapy was my favorite kind of therapy mm-hmm. um it was very cerebral and sort of i could see my own progress so one a good example of that is i initially i had double vision i had to wear special glasses to oh, okay. to not see double and i had to wear an eye patch sometimes and there was a lot of trouble there were a lot of issues related to my vision that were that were brain injury issues basically so with a lot of therapy i managed to overcome that and that's been the most rewarding probably element of my recovery is not having to wear glasses or or have vision issues anymore 
Um, All right, so you, you were telling me about some of these injuries, both the physical and the cognitive injuries. What about emotional? Were there any emotional changes from the brain injury? I would say actually no. I would say, well, possibly. <laughs> to a certain extent, I feel like I might be more emotionally labile a little bit. Mm-hmm. But but if if so, not by much. I'm I was pr- a pretty sensitive guy, sensitive, artistic, sort of mm-hmm. nurturing. I'm I was very like a very caring, kind of loving and giving person before, and I continue to be despite the brain damage. Right. So your is, personality, which is a plus. Yeah, yeah my, is a my personality is the same. Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so have you gone back to work since the injury? I have not. Um, unfortunately, even though I loved my job, I, it was a, it was a fast paced job. This, this customer support position that I had at the time, and it was very fast paced and it required being able to solve complex problems very quickly. And I was able to do that very well before the before the injury but afterwards my my processing is just not as quick as it needs to be so i mm-hmm. actually went and did like a follow up shadowing day with my company to see if i could if they could somehow find a position that would work for me for mm-hmm. me to be there with them because they loved me just as much as i loved them mm-hmm. and unfortunately it was like not not really they would have had to retrain me and probably considering my memory issues, probably retrain me pretty much constantly for a while mm-hmm. for me be, to be able to do that kind of work. So, mm-hmm. so, so I at have that not time you had the at the time you had the evaluation, you just weren't ready to return. Because yeah, of the, the cognitive demands of the job. Right, to be able to respond fast enough to do the kind of work that that I was doing was just not realistic, unfortunately. Yeah. Daniel, tell me a little about the therapies that you've received during the course of your recovery. So I've had um, physical, occupational, um, physical, occupational, cognitive therapies, speech therapy. Speech therapy, I guess, and cognitive therapy are kind of overlapping terms. Um, And they were, perhaps unsurprisingly, Physical therapy was my least favorite because I was never much of an athlete. So being told to like do these challenging physical things was pretty unpleasant for me. Mm-hmm. And so it was a little challenging to not, you know, resent the ther- the physical therapist. Like, please, you're you're torturing me. You know, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to lift more weight. Like, um, just let me let me like rest. Um, but it, I, I'm a good sport, you know, so I always did what I was asked to do. Um, and I think that's been a big component in my recovery is my willingness to do what is being requested of me by therapists or people who want, who I know, I know it's their job to make me better. So, so I, I'm a pretty willing participant most of the time. Um, I see. So you're a compliant patient. That's what you're saying. Yeah. I, I'm not much of a troublemaker. I never have been, which there's a, probably a lot that can be said about that, but. Do you want to say anything more about your other therapies? So occupational therapy was relatively useful. That was more of the getting dressed. I mean, cause you know, when I first came out of the coma, it's like I could not get dressed on my own. I couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. I couldn't do anything on my own. Mm-hmm. So learning how to like get dressed again, tying for the longest time, tying shoes was a big, big pain. Um, I always resented having to tie when the therapist would ask me to like tie shoes like I don't want to tie shoes just let me get some slip on shoes that'll be a lot easier and the therapist mm-hmm. was like no you have to tie shoes that's what normal people can do mm-hmm. so I was, I begrudgingly did learn to tie my shoes again mm-hmm. um, and you know in the those were the occupational therapy was pretty rewarding relatively we did a lot of cooking sometimes and that was useful um, there were things like related to typing, typing speed, because my typing speed was pretty atrocious at first. You know, I used to be able to type a million miles a second before my accident, before the accident. But afterwards, it was like very, very slow. Mm-hmm. And so relearning how to type 
proficiently was important. Sure. Relearn, relearning how to wear clothes and tie shoes and cook food and use the facilities like a normal person. Sure. Learning, so, learning how to drive was a big challenge. Right. That, yeah, that took. Are you that driving took, now? I am driving. Um, it was a long, hard road before I was able to drive again, much to my chagrin. I, I went through driving rehab and then extra driving rehab, and my parents paid for a, like a driving, they paid out of pocket for like a driving program that was up near the Palm Springs area where they like took cars, took cars around like a track to do like performance style driving, mm -hmm. which was pretty fun, but um, sort of more necessary for someone like me who has, you know, slowed reaction speed and stuff like that. So yeah. was it frustrating waiting for the recovery to heal enough to regain your independence, not only in driving, but other areas? Oh, the frustration was extreme and still continues, honestly, in some senses, in some ways, because there are still things that I I recognize that I was able to do them before, but I'm not able to do them now, or am able to do them now, but not as fast as I was able to do them before. Mm -hmm. And so that, that frustration has been very deep, and, and um, it's been um, sort of a life, and it's an ongoing life lesson, learning how to accept or deal with the frustration that I was and am encountering, you know. It's an ongoing challenge to think about how you used to be and how things are now and trying yeah. to figure out what you can do to improve and what you need to do psychologically to adjust to the change. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, I'm, I imagine that I am very similar to a lot of brain injury survivors and in that I've dealt with a fair amount of depression because, you know, you're not, it's hard to go from being on top to basically being, you know, chained into a bed in a hospital and then having to relearn everything you ever knew to get back to mm -hmm. real life. So, yeah. Yeah. You certainly were out of control of your life and you had to depend on others. And that's, uh, that's a pretty distressing feeling. It was, it was, they were dark times. <laughs> dark times. Yeah. What therapies do you think were most helpful in the course of your recovery? talk therapy for psychiatric struggles um, that's extremely useful because there's a lot of as you as you know there's a lot of there's a lot of frustration and anger and sadness and just emotional issues that come up with an issue like the kind that I have um, mm -hmm. and so talk therapy is extremely useful and I do feel like physical therapy was useful even though it was I I mean, I hated it, but I was, I recognize that it was useful. Um, yoga has been extremely, extremely useful. I started doing yoga not, not too long after my accident, when I was able to return to, when I, after I got my legs fixed and was able to sort of, when I was brought back to my home um, with my parents and was able to sort of be out of the hospital all the time, I started doing yoga and that has been extremely healthy, health, healthy, health, healthy and helpful and liberating. Um, and I, I recommend yoga to everyone I talk to these days, whether or not they're an injury survivor. I just think that yoga is like a great thing for everyone to do. Good for you. I, I also agree. I agree. How about healthcare providers? Which healthcare providers have you seen during the course? And I don't mean names, but what specialties have you worked with? And what did you find was the most helpful for you? So I, I see, I still see a personal trainer, like for weightlifting and building muscular strength. Um, mm -hmm. I see, I, I've been seeing him for a while. Ever since I got out of the hospital, I started seeing a personal trainer to regain strength. And that's very useful because I can see my progress with him, you know, and I'm good. Um, and so I see him twice a week. And mm -hmm. it's very, it's very useful. And he's like measuring, you know, trying to help me make progress and make measurable gains, you know, uh -huh. with the amount of, with the amount of weight I can lift and the amount of repetitions I can do and whatnot. Um, so that's useful. 
So you've got a fitness coach or strength trainer, and and are you seeing any other medical professionals? Um, I have my primary doctor who I, you know, have regular follow-ups with mm -hmm. yearly or whatever to make sure that everything is going okay, and that has that has been useful because I have had some strange, I have had some strange sort of idiosyncratic um, health anomalies over the last few years that have resolved, but were very mysterious. Um, one example was, say, go ahead. I was gonna say one example was that my liver enzymes, some kind of liver enzymes, the levels went really high and we don't know exactly why. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, my doctor, my primary was like, okay, we need to start figuring out why your liver is messed up. Do you drink a lot? And I was like, no, I, I never drink. Um, mm -hmm. Not never, but I very rarely drink. That's another unfortunate, well, unfortunate in quotes, is I, I can't really drink anymore. Al I mean, I can't really drink alcohol anymore just because it affects me very easily, very quickly. So, like, I might have one beer once in a while, but almost never. Well, how does it make you feel? Or what does it make you think when you drink alcohol? Um, it's fine. It's just, it's just, I... Like if I, I can definitely tell if I drank too much and didn't hydrate enough because I'll have a hangover that just feels horrible, you know, and I've had, hang, I've had, I remember hangovers before my accident and I remember hangovers after my accident and the hangovers before my accident, even though they might've been like bad, the hangovers after the accident are just unbelievably painful, like just crippling pain, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it feels like the only thing I can describe is like someone shot me in the brain with a gun, wow. you know, it's just. It's just like the most like full body, just horrid pain you can imagine. So I try not to drink too much because it's an unpleasant feeling. <laughs> Understood. Understood. Now, if you were to do anything differently during the course of your recovery, would there be anything that you would have changed in terms of treatment or timing? Yeah, I would have tried to start doing yoga earlier than I did in terms of, I mean, granted, that's probably, I probably started doing yoga just about as soon as I was able to, I guess, maybe. But I don't think I, re had I realized at the time how much I, how useful it is and how much I would have loved it, I would have been very, I would have been more gung-ho about like getting into yoga faster because right. now nowadays it's like, I can't wait to do it. You know, it's just, it, I can tell it helps my health and it helps it helps my state of well-being and it helps my mind. I mean, so yeah, if I could, if I could give advice to my past self, I'd be like, do everything you can to start doing yoga as soon as possible. You know, okay, Get to that point. let me ask you about the level of functioning. You you mentioned some some pretty serious injuries, a coma for a month, not being able to return to work because your your uh, processing wasn't as quick as it used to be. My processing um, and also my memory the, and your memory. memory the memory is right. probably a bigger part than even the processing because if I if I had the process down, I could have done it slowly, you know. But it's like, well, I can't remember the process because even though I just learned it a few minutes ago, I've forgotten it already, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, what? Tell me, what are you able to do? Are you living independently? You said you can drive now. What things can you do for yourself? So nowadays, I can do pretty much everything for myself. I can drive. I do all my own laundry and I um, buy my own groceries. Um, I volunteer at a hospital near my house um, once a week and that's pretty rewarding. Um, and so I can, I'm pretty much, it's interesting to talk to people because people don't realize how important short-term memory is. So my short-term memory is still not good. Um, and so people will tell me things, but not, and I'll tell them like, I won't remember this. And they, people just don't understand because mm -hmm. they haven't worked with someone like me or someone who's had my situation before. Right. Well, do they ever say, hey, Daniel, you're such a good speaker. You're so articulate. How could you have a brain injury? How could you still be affected? No one ever says that, but, but I can tell that people don't understand if that makes sense. Um, people will 
people will treat me, which is fine. I, I approve. I mean, I'm, I'm very okay with that being the case, but, but I look and sound so normal that no one suspects that I have brain damage. Um, and so I feel like, unfortunately, that does kind of sometimes put a level of conflict or it puts a, it puts a level of challenge that wouldn't normally be there if I didn't have brain damage. Do you have a specific example in mind of that level of challenge? Um, I was at one point after my accident, I was taking community college classes because I couldn't go back to my job, but I still wanted to be learning and, and getting better mentally. So I was taking these community college classes and while working with some of those teachers, they would teach me something and then the next day I wouldn't really remember it. And so they'd have to reteach it to me. And they, I definitely had conversations with with those teachers that was like, they were, they expressed shock that I was not able to remember what they had explained previously, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it has, yeah. it has happened, it has happened more than once where a teacher type figure would express surprise at me not remembering or not knowing something because they were surprised they had, that you had, go ahead. Be, because they had taught it to me multiple times, you know or show me multiple examples. And it's like, what do you mean you don't remember it anymore? It's like, uh, I don't know how to explain it to you. I just don't remember it anymore. Like, so. Understood, understood. Now, during this course of recovery, how do you find satisfaction? How do you find gratification in life? You said you really enjoyed your job, but unfortunately you haven't yet been able to return to it. So how do you get gratification right now? Yeah, so, that's a kind of a tough question. I I do struggle with, I still struggle with finding meaning in life, I guess, to, to a certain extent. Like, um, I, I find it gratifying to volunteer at the hospital where I volunteer, mm -hmm. even though it's relatively a small job. It's just, you know, working the front desk and admitting people and also mm -hmm. moving things like, doing small errands around the hospital, like running things around and taking things to the lab and getting stuff, you know, checked in or whatever. Um, so I find that satisfying. And I find, you know, fortunately, because of the lawsuit, I don't need to, I don't need to work anymore. Um, I got enough money out of the lawsuit in order to not need to work ever again. But that has its own sorts of issues because you know, you, like you were like you were saying, how do you find purpose in life if you right. don't have if you don't have a job? What do you do? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, I sort of try. I just tried not to. I try not to cause problems in the world. You know. Um, well, above and beyond that, it sounds like you found another channel or another outlet in which to help people. You were doing it through customer service, and now you're doing it through the hospital hospital volunteering. Yeah, and I'm also still looking at other um, volunteer options. So there are multiple little opportunities that I'm looking into, but they're sort of on the back burner in terms of priority because they're not, they're not, pre it's not pressing that I find them, but I still have, you know, some, some, sp if I manage my time well, which is a challenge, um, I still have time available. So I have applications that I'm, planning on, on finishing at some point and that would be more volunteer work to fill with my life with. Got it. Got it. So what strategies or tactics do you use to help with some of the memory problems and organizational problems? You said managing your time well and so on. Do you have any strategies or tips or things that you use to, to be I, more efficient? I find it extremely useful and this isn't uh, an advertising pitch or anything, but I use the Evernote program pretty much yeah. constantly. Um, okay. because so the disc use... disclaimer is that you have no financial relationship. With, yeah, I, I'm, with I'm not connected to Evernote at all, but okay. I, I, use their, I used their service before I had brain damage. And, yeah. and I'm guessing, I don't know for a fact, but I'm guessing that I found it pretty useful before. And since, since the accident, I've gone back to using Evernote and I use it pretty much constantly 
to keep a record of of what I do every day and keep my notes and keep um, reminders and everything and maps and all sorts of stuff. It's all in the cloud. So, and I even feel, I feel, I have mixed feelings actually about that because I'm aware of the, it's not good to be too dependent on, on something necessarily. So I try to be cognizant of also having stuff in my mind in addition to in, in the cloud, you know, so you know, I, I do that, Evernote all the time, pretty yeah. much. I think the challenge is using our potential to the fullest, but also recognizing the limits and being willing and able to depend on assistive technology, let's say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's definitely true. What advice do you have for other brain injury survivors, for family members, and for healthcare treaters? I would say physical movement is extremely important. So, and uh, that's definitely a problem with people who have, you know, physical and brain injuries is sometimes your brain doesn't want to move or, or whatever. So it's, it's important to start moving as much as uh, moving is motion is life. So mm -hmm. moving is very important. You know, if you could take dance classes or take yoga classes or any kind of any kind of activity that's going to involve your body, and especially your body and mind, like dance or like yoga or, mm -hmm. or, I guess those are the other things: dancing and yoga, mm -hmm. um, or there are kinds of stretching exercises and stuff. Um, so being using your body is probably the most important. People don't realize how how much your brain and body are connected. I think so. Mm -hmm. That's one, one piece of advice. Another thing is don't give up hope, even though it's very easy to give up hope. Um, mm -hmm. But being hopeful is important just because it's not healthy if you have a negative attitude. And that, that can be very hard, I know for sure. I've firsthand, firsthand experience that being hopeful when you don't feel hopeful is mm -hmm. not, not really a realistic thing to tell someone, but... Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, just be patient with yourself. Try. Uh, I'm I'm very hard on myself. I have high expectations for myself, and so I'm pretty upset, I suppose, sometimes if I don't achieve something, you know, as quickly as I was able to in the past, or if I don't figure something out as quickly as I was able to in the past. Mm -hmm. So, but having having being able to forgive yourself is very important. It is important. How did you learn to do that? Um, I, I didn't really. Um, well, it's, it, you mean it's a work in progress? Yeah, it's a work in progress. I, you just have to dissociate, disassociate yourself from, from your problems, I suppose. So it's like, yeah, this is this is a problem, but you know, it's, it's not you. It's just the reality around you, if that makes sense. So, okay. Or another way of putting it is, is to recognize if you fall short of that, that goal, what you used to be, that doesn't mean you're a terrible person or you're worthless. Yeah, exactly. And it's like there, it's, the future still exists, you know, so you will, there will always be time and opportunities to, to improve and change what may be broken or not working optimally at the moment. So... Mm -hmm. Having an open mind towards the future, I think, is important, and having having social inter having a lot of social interaction, I think, is a good idea too. It helps to be it helps to be distracted, which is kind of counterintuitive because distraction is not a good thing in some senses, you know. But being distracted when you have issues like broken legs or or sure. broken you're bones, not, whatever. you're not dwelling on the physical or the emotional pain as much when you're right. interacting with people. Yeah, when you're with friends and when you're with, you know, people who care about you and people who want to help you improve and get better, that's important. And part of, part of that is also, like, finding what you can do to be, to pay it forward, I guess. So, and so yes. I try to do that a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I try to make people feel appreciated and happy. I mean, and that's what I was doing before, so I guess that's just my internal nature is to try and make things better for people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I find that it's a good outlet um, in terms of health, mental health. I, 
Yeah, well, I agree with you for anybody, whether there's a brain injury or not, it's helpful to find a way to contribute and make the world a better place on whatever level you can find. Yeah. What else didn't we cover that you want to talk about? Advice for healthcare providers who work with TBI yes. survivors. I don't know. There's a there's a delicate balance between pushing too much and pushing not enough. Um, for doctors, I've had I've had a lot of doctors. Um, mm -hmm. I, doctors is kind of a tough one because I feel like some some doctors have kind of an attitude of like I'm a you know fancy important doctor and like. You're just another patient to cross off the list, you know, and so they're just like clear. They're like, they want to get you out of their office fast or whatever. I mean, they, a lot of them don't show that attitude, but you can sort of sense it. And that's like, how do you fix that in someone, right? Like, change your underlying personality so that you're a better doctor toward me. Like, that's not going to happen. So I just, just try not to get too involved with doctors that don't treat you the way you want to be treated. I suppose. Um, but what but, you, what I hear you saying is you'd like to be treated with respect and compassion and, and a genuine interest in you. Yeah, I think I think a lot of um, a lot of authority figures, whether they be doctors or therapists or whatever, they have sort of a almost inherently dismissive kind of attitude because it's or like belittling attitude because it's like I'm I'm the authority telling you what to do and you are my patient or my client or whatever and so you are the little person in this situation. I'm the big person and you should, you know, follow my rules and, and do yeah. do as I say or whatever. And that's, I've always been kind of a, I've had a tint of, a hint of rebelliousness in my personality ever since I was a little kid. And so it's sort of hard to have people like talk down to you or like treat you like you're not their equal or whatever, yeah. which. To, to act superior and give this feeling that I'm the doctor and you're not. Yeah. So what you'd like, it sounds like you'd like a more collaborative relationship with the doctor saying, hey, there's a problem. It's you and me against your problem. We're going to roll up our sleeves and work together. On this. Yeah. I mean, fortunately, I don't really have any, I don't really have those kind of doctor's appointments anymore. Those are all mostly behind me. So, mm -hmm. but in the past, that was how it was. Yeah. It was, I see. I see. But, but now everyone's pretty much great. Good. Do you have any other advice or any other comments that you want to say about your recovery? Be hopeful, do yoga, drink a lot of water. I think most people don't drink enough water. I, I still don't drink enough water, even though I'm, I try to be mindful about my water intake, but drinking mm -hmm. a lot of water every day is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And sleep is very important. So mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll want to sleep or I'll feel tired, but you know, you should listen to yourself and and rest if you if your body's telling you you need rest, even though you might want to get up and be active and do stuff. Like if you feel if your body feels tired, then you should rest. Mm -hmm. I think. Pay attention. Yeah, pay like try to try to be sensitive to what your body is telling you, despite what mm -hmm. you might want in your you know another level of your brain. Daniel, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today, and I wish you the very best. Please like, subscribe, and comment on this video.